Welcome everybody to today's Baker Botts webinar on the U.S. Supreme Court and its impact on patent rights. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to a very exciting program. My name is Aaron Street. I'm the chairman of the Supreme Court and Constitutional Law Practice here at Baker Botts. And I'm joined on the panel by Michael Hawes, who is a partner in the intellectual property practice at Baker Botts. Jennifer Nall, who is a senior associate in the intellectual property practice here, as well as Matthew Kelly, who is the chief intellectual property counsel, managing director, and associate general counsel at the CME Group. For questions during or after this program, please email Jason Rosenthal. His email address is jason.rosenthal at bakerbots.com. This program has been approved for the following CLE credit, Texas and California, one hour ethics, participatory, New York, one hour ethics, transitional and non-transitional. Toward the end of the program, I'll read a CLE verification code that you'll need to include on the CLE affirmation form you received along with this program's reminder. And an evaluation form will be sent after today's webinar. Also, a recording of the webinar will be circulated in the next few days and will be posted to the firm website, which is www.bakerbots.com. Well, it was, a, it was certainly an exciting and eventful term. No doubt the most significant event of the term was the passing of Justice Antonin Scalia, who served on the court from 1986 to 2016 in February of this term. Now, he certainly had a huge impact on law in a variety of, of ways, particularly his, his uh, exposition of the principles of originalism and textualism. However, he's not known as the most impactful justice when it comes to patent law. He only issued nine majority opinions in patent law cases. And he was somewhat famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, uh, for his skepticism towards uh, his ability to understand the science in some of the patent cases. A couple terms ago in the Myriad case, he filed a, a very interesting concurrence in which he said, I don't really understand anything that the majority said on my own information or belief, but to the extent I can understand it, it seems right to me. Uh, so maybe that was why he didn't write so many patent decisions. But he did write Metamune. He did write a very interesting uh, dissent in the Kamal case on induced infringement. Uh, overall, the term was won uh, with a few deadlocks. The court tied four to four, uh, eight, uh, four to four uh, on the eight justice court, but only did so four times after Justice Scalia's death. The court really attempted to avoid deadlocks by re reaching uh, narrow decisions as much as possible. The Chief Justice uh, led the court to decide cases on narrow grounds and sometimes even grounds that didn't seem to be squarely presented in order to avoid uh, tie decisions that would give no precedential guidance to the lower courts and to the, the regulated community. You, you know that, of course, uh, Judge Merrick Garland, the Chief Judge of the D.C. Circuit, has been nominated by President Obama to fill the vacancy, his vacancy. Uh, that vacancy appears to uh, remain open for quite a while. Uh, the Senate, of course, has vowed not to confirm Judge Garland, and uh, the next president will most likely get to make that appointment, although we'll talk a little bit more about the timeline for filling that vacancy and how it might affect patent cases. While the court deadlocked and issued narrow decisions in a lot of areas of law, it didn't do so in IP law, keeping with the trend that these cases are not typically political or ideological. Uh, the court generally was either unanimous or, or overwhelmingly ruled one way or the other. Although, I think when you read between the lines, the attorney's fees and enhanced damages cases we'll talk about today were written in such a way to garner the maximum number of votes. The court certainly didn't dodge any of the issues in the case. And with that overview, I'll turn it over to Michael to discuss our first case of the day. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, first case of the day is really the probably the biggest sea change in patent law that came out this term. 
though I think a lot of folks expected that there was going to be a change and not just an affirmance based on what had happened last year. And that's the HALO Electronics versus Pulse Electronics and uh, companion case Stryker v. Zimmer. So that case concerned the question of the Federal Circuit using a rigid two-part rule for determining when enhanced damages are appropriate. Uh, enhanced damages being the ability to get three times what the actual damages are when you are a patentee. Um, we find that obviously in other areas like antitrust law, but patent law has its own rule for how to, to get those triplings, and the Federal Circuit had set it up with a fairly complex requirement, and you can see from the question presented that uh, that was not put in a favorable light in view of the Supreme Court's ruling last term, or two terms ago, regarding the octane fitness situation. And there it was attorney fees, but a similarly rigid formulation that the, uh, the court did not agree with. So let's look specifically at what was going on. Um, the court was looking at 285 as opposed to 284. And in 285, you'll see that attorney's fees were for exceptional cases, whereas 284 just said may increase and actually didn't even use the term exceptional. There was really no language there to guide specifically what Congress was after. So in view of that statutory language and the difference between those two, uh, the Supreme Court looked at the Federal Circuit standard and basically said under that very loose language, the Federal Hi, Circuit uh, I to, uh, was just overly rigid. It was not as flexible as that statutory requires, that statute language requires this test to be. And that's what allowed for the Supreme Court to come up with a new test, a flexible test. And the overruled text uh, required two parts. It required an objective prong and a subjective prong. Uh, the objectively high likelihood was from the viewpoint not of the particular infringer and what they thought internally, but kind of viewed from the court's perspective but there was also a second prong that did go to what the infringer knew and what was known to the infringer. And the Federal Circuit required clear and convincing evidence for both of those prongs. And importantly, had the court taking the lead in the objective prong, which had resulted in a lot of rulings of no willfulness and thus no enhanced damages by the judge well before the issue got to trial. Well, the Supreme Court didn't agree, and it vacated and remanded and gave us a new test for enhanced damages. Um, it held that the, the Federal Circuit's Seagate two-prong test unduly restricted the discretion of the lower courts. It helpfully told us that there's no one formula, uh, but it did give some suggestions about how the egregiousness or culpability of the conduct had to be uh, looked at in terms of the two centuries of enhanced damages under patent law. And importantly, the Supreme Court said that clear and convincing evidence was not needed. Mere preponderance of the evidence was the standard. And this is very similar to what they did in Octane Fitness with regard to attorney's fees. Um, so probably wasn't a big surprise. And in the same way, the determination, the review at the appellate court, the Federal Circuit, was no longer de novo review with regard to that objective prong and now was abuse of discretion review. Also very similar to what had happened with regard to attorney fees. But now let's get to kind of the meat of it. So that's what the Supreme Court did. What is gonna be the real world impact? Where, where is this gonna have uh, an important role as we move forward with patent litigation or even consideration of disputes that might become patent litigation with respect to this new standard? Well, first of all, you have a fairly obvious category of cases where the court had already ruled on summary judgment of no willfulness using that objective prong. These are ongoing cases where the defendant thought that enhanced damages were out of the picture. And 
they find now that there's going to be a challenge and a reconsideration potentially of that summary judgment. Um, in fact, there's, there's one in Delaware right now where both the plaintiff and the defendant have agreed after the court sua sponte ordered them to give briefing on the impact of HALO, and both parties agreed that the summary judgment needed to be vacated. Now, of course, the defendant thinks summary judgment is still appropriate under the new uh, standard, but they both agreed that because the original summary judgment had concerned the objective prong, that it needed to be vacated. So that will have a big impact, and it's especially true. One of the kind of wrinkles here is that you've got a number of parties who have good defenses, for example, under Section 101, based on the Supreme Court's recent Alice case. But if the subjective prong concerns their behavior before the Supreme Court's Alice case, before the new 101 law of just a few years ago, all of a sudden that will not be a basis on which they can say they were not willful or egregious enough for enhanced damages. So that can make a very big difference in a case with a close call on Section 101. I think there will be more forum shopping, more of an emphasis for plaintiffs on which judge they are going to try to get in front of with their case. Obviously, this has always been something that plaintiffs look at, but now enhanced damages is very much in the hands of that district court judge with only abuse of discretion review at the federal circuit. And the Supreme Court, both in terms of granting enhanced damages, but also in terms of denying enhanced damages, gave the Supreme Court, gave the district court judges more latitude. Uh, they specifically talked about how even where there's egregious behavior, the district court judge could decide not to grant enhanced damages. So a, a clear push for more discretion for the district court judge, which of course makes the plaintiff's choice of forum all the more important and perhaps more transfer motions to be filed by defendants. The third point it kind of goes along with that summary judgment point, which is if it's harder to get summary judgment of no willful infringement, that means enhanced damages will still be in play as pretrial, as you get ready for trial in that pretrial period. And often there is a discussion between the parties of possible settlement as you're getting ready for trial. If there isn't summary judgment of willfulness or if there's or non-willfulness, or if that happens in fewer cases, you may see more leverage for plaintiffs with the worst case scenario still being three times the potential damages. That scenario will be a real problem as decision makers are deciding whether to settle a case as trial approaches. And it will be a problem even if the number of enhanced damages rulings actually do not change. If that decision is being made after trial rather than by summary judgment, it creates a leverage situation right there before trial. We also anticipate that there are going to be more battles over discovery and admissibility of what I guess is uh, not politically correctly called stupid employee emails on this slide. Uh, but my guess is a number of people on the phone understand what's being referred to there, which is some employee might say something in an email that makes it sound like the defendant doesn't care about the patent or in some other way is acting willfully. You know, plaintiffs always push for this type of discovery, but in the face of Seagate, probably not as many resources would be put toward that if willfulness was going to be shut out on summary judgment based on trial defenses. But now that threat is much less, and the plaintiffs are probably going to push harder to get this kind of discovery. Finally, there's an, uh, an ongoing issue that's quite interesting, which is whether HALO gives defense attorneys a chance to remove willfulness from the jury. This is something that would actually be a valuable outcome of this case for defendants. I mean, we've been talking about how plaintiffs love HALO and love Stryker and, and think that it's a good deal for them, but there might be a truly ironic outcome if plaintiffs, having pushed for the HALO Stryker result, have instead a result of the jury not handling willfulness anymore. And the reason this might occur is because the Supreme Court talked a lot about how the current enhanced damages statute is rooted in the law of the 19th century that occurred after triple damages, discretionary triple damages were first introduced in the 1836 Patent Act. And there are several of those cases from the 19th century where the Supreme Court has talked about how 
the jury is confined, and that's the word they actually use, confined to actual damages. And so an argument could be made that once the Supreme Court said that the current statute is rooted in that old law, that also means that the jury shouldn't be having anything to do with the underpinnings of enhanced, enhanced damages, including willfulness. And there's also an argument that HALO talks a lot about how the determination of egregiousness must be uh, made in the context of two centuries of law. And, you know, clearly that's not usually what juries do. That's usually what judges do. So that battle has already been teed up in a couple of cases uh, that I'm aware of. And I expect we're going to see some rulings about whether HALO has actually helped the defense in some situations by taking willfulness away from the jury in jury trials. So a lot, a lot of impact for HALO, that, and these, you know, probably there will be others that are unforeseen, but certainly a case that had a lot of impact. So now we're going to turn to the copyright arena and hand it over to Aaron to discuss the copyright arena. Thank you, Michael. Kurt Sang versus John Wiley and Sons, Inc. is one of those rare Supreme Court cases that returned to the Supreme Court for a second merits decision. The first merits decision in Kurt Sang had to do with the scope of the first sale doctrine, and the court ruled for Kurt Sang. Kurt Sang went back to the district court and asked for attorney's fees as the prevailing party. And the question again returned to the Supreme Court on what is the appropriate standard for awarding attorney's fees to a prevailing party under Section 505 of the Copyright Act. Much like the statute that Michael discussed in HALO, the Copyright Act's attorney's fees provision is very open-ended. It simply provides that a court may award a reasonable attorney's fee to the prevailing party in a copyright case. So once again, the Supreme Court was called upon to pour meaning into open-ended language that connotes a district court's discretion. Not surprisingly, given the vagueness of the language, you see a circuit split developed on the proper test for awarding attorney's fees. The second Circuit held that substantial weight must be given to the objective reasonableness of the party's positions in the case in determining whether attorney's fees are appropriate. The fourth circuit used more of a totality of the circumstances approach without giving particular weight to any one factor. And the fifth applied a presumption uh, that attorney's fees are appropriate whenever uh, the party prevails. The Supreme Court uh, vacated and remanded the Second Circuit's decision. That, that outcome tells you very little about what the Supreme Court held, but the Supreme Court was quite clear in the test going forward for attorney's fees. Justice Kagan wrote the opinion for the unanimous court in this case, and she, she wrote that objective reasonableness of the losing party's arguments is a very important factor, but it's not the controlling factor. It's very important for the reason that uh, giving weight to the party's positions encourages parties to stand on their rights when they have a valid claim, but deters those with weak copyright claims or defenses from pursuing litigation to the hilt. In other words, if you have a good claim or defense, you shouldn't be deterred from the fact that you might have to bear your own litigation costs. Somebody shouldn't be able to a chill your attempt to assert your rights by running up attorney's fees with a frivolous claim. However, the Supreme Court uh, said that there are other relevant circumstances that a district court should consider in exercising its discretion to award attorney's fees, particularly whether the party uh, engaged in misbehavior, made over-aggressive claims, and the court explained that these other factors should be considered in light of the purposes of the Copyright Act, uh, compensation, deterrence, encouraging parties to, uh, to protect their copyrights, uh, but not uh, assert frivolous claims. So going forward, <clears throat> the courts can make awards even where 
the party, uh, the losing party, took an objectively reasonable position. I think that's the important takeaway. While objective reasonableness is the most important factor, the court can look at these other circumstances and still decide to make an attorney's fee award, uh, even when the losing party made an objectively reasonable uh, argument. Uh, this decision is evidence of the Supreme Court's continuing interest in attorney's fee statutes. Last term, uh, as Michael mentioned, the court took up attorney's fees in exceptional cases under the Patent Act. The previous term, the court uh, took up bankruptcy attorney's fees in a relatively limited uh, context of when fees uh, are sought at the end of a bankruptcy. And it's understandable, again, these statutes speak in vague terms, and the court seems to be trending in favor of greater district court discretion, which makes sense because that's the court that's aware of the case on a day-to-day -day basis. Now I would like to uh, ask Matthew uh, to weigh in on the practical impact of this decision going forward. Yeah, from uh, the in-house perspective, you know, the attorney's fees in copyright cases uh, you know, has been out there. To me, I, I think that this, um, probably the copyright owners take, uh, um, uh, take this as a, a uh, something in their favor rather than more of a, a neutral one. Um, and especially if you're at the lower end of the copyright um, spectrum, you know, people you might call it copyright trolls, or the people that are going to collect relatively small dollar amounts from lots of different companies. Um, you know, you can imagine if someone used an image from uh, the internet without uh, paying for permission, those small claims, the attorney fee provision of the Copyright Act weighs in substantially because if there's a claim for small dollar amounts, ten, twenty thousand um, dollars, the provision for attorney's fees is going to swamp the the request for damages, even if they're licensing that photograph or that audio clip for you know a hundred dollars for a lifetime license. They may come after you for uh, you know ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars for use of that uh, clip once or twice. So the attorney fee award is is important. I think that this moves it further uh, down that down that line where it will be used at that lower end of the copyright spectrum uh, much more aggressively. And the over aggressive claims that uh, the court did talk about do happen all the time, but they're rarely the ones that get litigated um, unless it's uh, you know, done on a large enough scale where uh, enough companies are gonna get together. Matthew, how does that compare in importance from your point of view to the enhanced damages ruling in HALO? Well, in, in my world, the, the patent numbers are always much larger than any copyright number that people could come up with in terms of uh, potential damages. So the um, Halo Striker is far more significant uh, to me. I think that that case um, is actually gonna change, not just, you know, the, the copyright um, case is gonna change my, the way I act when someone calls me. The Halo Striker is actually gonna cause me to change my practice before anybody calls me or writes me a letter. Um, there with the uh, enhanced damages, you know, I'm, I'm, I might be going back into the uh, opinion of counsel, the clearance opinion um, practice on a lot larger scale than I did before. You know, the, the case laws had moved, you know, uh, if you go back 15, 20 years ago, opinions of counsel were um, very much needed all the time, anytime you became remotely aware of patents. Then the pendulum swung back to, you know, the significance of those opinions were uh, uh, greatly diminished, and HALO brings that back. So that's something that um, I'm going to do even before someone knocks on my door. Then I think HALO Striker, once you're involved in a litigation, I think it makes the outcome of that litigation, the total dollar amount of exposure, much less predictable than it was before HALO. And so that's gonna affect my settlement discussions. I think it's gonna result in fewer settlements 
because my assessment of the uh, enhanced damages and the patent owner's assessment of patent damages, I think are now gonna be further apart than they were before HALO. Um, and so to me, HALO is gonna cost me more money and make litigation less predictable. Well, you know, the other case we had this term also went into the changing nature of patent litigation. So Jennifer, you want to address Quozo? So Quozo Speed Technologies versus Michelle Lee was the first um, appeal of an IPR, an inter-parties re-examination under the new AIA, the American Event, America Invents Act. And this made it up to the Supreme Court on two issues, whether the regulations promulgated by the PTO with respect to the claim construction interpretation um, methodology used by the PTO during IPR proceedings was correct, and also whether the um, decision to institute was judicially unreviewable, even if it's at odds, even if it's at direct odds, perhaps, with a statutory provision. Um, Going first into the broadest reasonable interpretation, which is the um, claim construction methodology that was promulgated in a regulation by the PTAB, the, for background, the district courts use plain and ordinary meaning to a person of ordinary skill in the art, which is or should at least be a subset of broadest reasonable interpretation, which is used by the PTO um, historically for claims that, for patents that haven't expired and has been um, accepted by the PTAB for use in IPR proceedings. The regulations, the PTAB promulgated these regulations um, and the Federal Circuit affirmed the use of broadest reasonable interpretation based on the fact that it's historically been used and that Congress knew that when enacting the AIA and that the statute, one provision, one, one statute explicitly gave um, the PTO the uh, authority to issue regulations that would establish the grounds governing inter-parties review and the relationship to, um, between IPR and other proceedings. And based on those, based on all of that, the Federal Circuit affirmed the use of broadest reasonable interpretation. The Supreme Court affirmed that decision, um, agreeing that Congress gave authority to issue regulations governing inter-parties review, including um, for claim construction, and that the decision to promulgate a BRI rule on claim construction should be reviewed under Chevron deference to the PTO, and that looking at it, looking at that regulation, it was a reasonable exercise of rulemaking authority. This was a unanimous, this was the unanimous part of the decision written by Justice Breyer. The second issue that was addressed by the Supreme Court was whether the PTAB um, decision to institute was unreviewable. And for background, the, the PTAB has the authority, the statutory authority to um, institute ground, on grounds that are identified with particularity in the, in the petition. And the statute also says the director may not authorize an IPR to be instituted unless that information was presented in that petition. Um, the Federal Circuit held the decision to institute was not reviewable based on 314D, which says that the decision to institute shall be final and non-appealable. For background, Garmin, in, um, Garmin, for one of the dependent claims, asserted grounds for unpatentability that it did not assert against the independent claim, and the PTAB instituted on the independent claim with respect to the dependent claim grounds. So, Pozo was arguing that those grounds were not identified with particularity with respect to that independent claim. Um, Garmin disagreed um, and then settled. So Michelle Lee then disagreed that it was um, that it was not identified with particularity because the dependent claim um, is is if you invalidate a dependent claim, you're necessarily invalidating the independent claim. So there was a disagreement as to whether it was identified with particularity, but this, um, that was not addressed. It was found it was just not appeal reviewable 
on appeal. And the Supreme Court affirmed um, this was not the unanimous part of the decision. The, the Supreme Court held it was not reviewable because for one thing, that is what the statute explicitly says. And when reading this statute, you must at least forbid an attack of this kind of legal question that was being um, asserted by Quozo. And to hold otherwise would undercut the, the objective that was clear from the AIA, AIA to give the PTO significant power to revisit and revise earlier patent grants. The, um, the interesting thing is that it, the Supreme Court did not put a stop to all possible future appeals of institution decisions for constitutional issues or shenanigans, that's a quote. Um, shenanigans would be something like a institution on a 112 indefiniteness argument, which is not allowed under the, the plain grant of authority by Congress to the PTO for IPR proceedings. So it will be interesting to see what happens with that shenanigans. Um, the real world impacts, so one of them is that this is this is a deference was given to the PTO for interpretation of its governing statutes in a way that at least I hadn't seen before. And so that would be, that will be very interesting to see how that plays in the future and how that kind of deference will um, be used by litigants at, in future cases to try and, and get or to get the PTO um, regulations affirmed on other issues. The, the interesting thing, this was a new statute, and um, and so now the PTAB continues to have. Oh well, the PTAB continues to have the authority, the ability to read claims more broadly than district courts. So you can have a PTAB broad construction to find if you're the petitioner to find the claim in unpatentable, and in the district court, if you're the defendant, argue a narrow construction to to find the claim is um, not infringed, and that is not inconsistent. You're allowed to do that. Um, then the final real-world impact is that I, IPR proceedings might be reviewable in special circumstances. So that will be interesting to see if any, any lit litigants come up with special cir circumstances to appeal, for example, constitutional issues. Um, I personally don't believe shenanigans are going to, to happen in the future. The, the other interesting thing is that the the, PT, the IPR proceedings continue to be a very a friendly place for litigants to um, for defendants to take patents to try and get them found unpatentable and honest. Um, so I'm next going to see if Matthew Kelly has any comments about Quozo's impact. Um, well, I, I think Quozo's biggest impact is it. It's going to stem the tide of all the people that thought the PTAB's proceedings were wrong. And there was a, a large vocal uh, uh, part of our community that thought both uh, the broadest reasonable interpretation was the wrong standard as well as the non-institution, uh, no appeal from the institution decision. Um, so BRE is now settled. We know that that's what it's going to be going forward. Um, and that's what it has been in the past. Um, I personally think that was the right answer. The Patent Office is really good at using one standard, to have them using different standards uh, in different proceedings would uh, be challenging for the Patent Office, I think, especially when some of those proceedings could actually be consolidated. You could have a re-exam and a review consolidated, but I don't think that's ever happened. Um, theoretically, you could have that um, consolidated, and uh, having different standards would have then made those uh, consolidated proceedings impossible. Um, as far as the non-institution, you know, Congress wrote it that way. I, I myself even think it's a little bit draconian, but that's the way the statute's written. If you want to change it, it's not the courts and it's not the patent office. It's Congress that uh, needs to change it. Um, as far as impact on uh, from the corporate perspective, you know I'm I'm a big fan of uh, the Patent Office reviewing patents and re-examining patents. It's been doing it since 
1981 when uh, ex parte re-exams uh, came about. Uh, I think it's doing a much better job these days of reviewing its own patents than it had, you know, uh, five or ten years ago. And the results coming out of the um, PTAB, uh, I haven't seen, you know, there's been a few reversals at the Federal Circuit, but as far as a form that gets appealed to the Federal Circuit, I think the PTAB has the highest affirmance rating of any of the, the forms that can be appealed to the Federal Circuit. So um, with that, I'm, I'm a big fan of the PTAB. Um, and I think both these rulings uh, make sense, both from the statute as well as from a practical standpoint. Um, my, my personal view uh, of, uh, of Section 314 is you only need one claim that's properly pled, and then you get into the um, IPR or CBM or post-grant review. Um, and if they want to raise other ones or mix around the um, prior art in a different way than was in the petition, as long as there's one claim that is properly uh, petitioned for, I think the PTAB has um, the latitude to reformulate uh, um, the 103 arguments in particular. Um, and, and I think Quozo's um, doing that, or says that that's okay. Um, I, I'd like to see it taken one step further because I actually had the situation where I petitioned, this was in a covered business method uh, patent review. I petitioned using 103 grounds and the, the PTAB agreed with me, but on some of the claims, they thought there was a 112 problem uh, in terms of indefiniteness. And so they refused to institute on those grounds, even though all the other claims that were very similar um, they agreed on the 103 grounds, and they said, well, we can't do a 112 because you didn't petition for it, so file a new petition, essentially. They didn't say it quite that way. So I filed a new petition that had both the 103 and 112 grounds uh, in it, and they instituted on both grounds. To me, one, it cost me more money to, to do the second petition. Two, it delayed um, that the resolution of those claims, and I would prefer that the PTAB take Quozo and really think about how it would affect other situations like someone petitioned for a 103, they find a 112 problem, um, and then instead of dealing with those claims that they've now found two problems with, right now their procedure is to kick those claims back out and not institute them. Um, so, Real world, if anyone from the PTAB is listening, you heard my suggestions. You also heard it in other uh, forms uh, where I've made the similar suggestion um, before Quozo. Now I have Quozo supporting me, uh, I think, a little bit. Thanks, Matthew. That covers the Supreme Court's patent decisions in October term 2015. So turning to a brief overview of October 2016 term and the Supreme Court's patent decisions that are ahead. First of all, uh, the court continues to be interested in patent law. They've already granted three cases, and we haven't even started the next term yet. Uh, it's very difficult to get cert granted on an eight justice court. You still need four votes to grant cert out of eight, and the court has been reluctant to grant cert in a lot of other areas of law, but not in patent law. Why is that? Well, probably two reasons. Again, patent law is not very likely to lead to tie votes. It's not one, uh, it's not an area of law, of law with a lot of ideological valence. Uh, two, there have been statutory enactments recently. Unlike a lot of other areas of law where Congress hasn't done anything for decades, Congress just passed the American Invents Act. It passed uh, by Dole not very long ago. It's, it has a lot of open issues uh, to be interpreted and construed by the Supreme Court. Looming in the background is the question of when we'll get our ninth justice and who will it be? Uh, probably the earliest we could get a new justice would be halfway through the next Supreme Court term. That could happen if the Senate 
chooses to confirm Judge Garland in the lame duck session between the November 2016 election and the new Congress and new president in January 2017. If that, if that happened, that would be about halfway through uh, the term. Judge Garland would not be able to vote on any of the cases argued before that, most likely, but he could perhaps get up to speed quickly and start uh, in calendar year 2017. More likely, uh, or, or probably at least as likely as that scenario, the, Supreme, the Senate says it's not going to confirm Judge Garland even during the lame duck session. So the more likely scenario is we don't get a nominee until we have a new president. And there you see our distinguished choices. Uh, and that president, whoever it may be, would certainly make a nominee, uh, make a nomination expeditiously. But it would take the Senate you know, some time. Not, I think the Senate would also act fairly quickly, but it would still take uh, certainly a couple months at least for the Senate to do its due diligence. So by that time, we're almost to the end of the 2016 term. Um, again, this just means there are, there's at least a theoretical possibility of tie votes for quite a while into the future. Whether that will actually happen in patent cases remains to be seen, and we'll, we could give some uh, judgment on that as we look at the cases in which cert has been granted so far. But what difference will the new justice make for IP law? Probably not very much. Most of these cases are not five to four. They're not cases in which Justice Scalia's replacement will swing a result, uh, at least if if history is any guide to the future. A couple issues to keep in mind, though. Uh, Jennifer mentioned deference to the agency uh, as being a fairly new and, and relevant uh, topic in patent law. Judge Garland comes from the D.C. Circuit. He is uh, reputed to be one who, who believes in Chevron deference to agencies and tends to give agencies a fairly wide berth in interpreting statutes. Justice Scalia also was, uh, but, but probably not as much as Judge Garland would be if he took the bench. Uh, another important issue to keep an eye on is legislative history. Justice Scalia was, was well known for not, a, not ever looking at legislative history if the statutory language was clear uh, and probably not giving it much weight even where the statutory language was ambiguous. Judge Garland is much more in the mainstream on that issue. He would look at legislative history. And again, with a lot of new statutes being enacted, uh, that, that could be quite relevant. Uh, one final thought, just Justice Scalia's, uh, perhaps his most important patent case, didn't really have that much to do with patent law. It was probably the College Savings Bank case in which he held that 11th Amendment sovereign immunity uh, prevented patent infringement claims against states. Uh, that was a five to four decision. And that is one, probably one of the very few where Judge Garland or uh, certainly a Democratic nominee might make a difference. That whole area of 11th Amendment sovereign immunity is a 5-4 to four issue. It could very well be revisited. It's one that a lot of uh, judges and scholars think uh, the court got wrong and, and might be right for overruling. So with that, we'll turn to the first case uh, that we're going to discuss for October 2016 term, which is Samsung Electronics. So Samsung Electronics v. Apple is a case about, a, about design patents, which is not um, often discussed in, in intellectual property law circles, but it is definitely very interesting. So the question presented for the Supreme Court is where a design patent is applied to only a component of a product, should an award of the infringer's products be, profits be limited to those profits attributable to the component? And we already have the briefing from Samsung and the amicus curie, including a U.S. amicus uh, amicus curie from um, on behalf of neither party. The, the Apple's briefing is not due until the end of July. So, for background, Apple sued Samsung for infringement of three design patents covering the shape of the phone and the shape including the button and then also the display of, of icons on, on the home screen basically of, your iPhone, of somebody's iPhone. And they were found, they were found to infringe, um, Samsung was found to infringe and the jury in, awarded all of the profits for the phones totaling $399 million based on the statute which says that 
the infringer shall be liable to the owner of the patent for the, to the extent of his total profit. So Samsung appealed to the Federal Circuit and argued a couple grounds. Um, one was that the, the damages have to be tied to the infringement and caused by the infringement. The Federal Circuit rejected that argument saying that the, um, the language of 289 prevents a causation rule. And Samsung also arg argued that the article of manufacture, which is part of the statute, um, is, is part of the language of the statute, should be limited to the shell of the cell phone case, of the cell phone. And um, the Federal Circuit rejected that because the, the shell is not available sold separately. It's not a, it's not something that, um, it's not an article of manufacture as, as a whole. And there was a Second Circuit case relied on by Samsung that was based on the case around a piano you could buy the case and later fill in the keys and the strings and the um, profits for just the case, not the total piano, was was found to be the profits that had to be disgorged in that one. Oh, um, Matthew, do you have any um, comments about Samsung v. Apple? Yeah, my, my only comment, you know, we're I'm in, I'm in the financial services industry and the software um, side of that. We haven't historically been uh, very focused on design patents, but uh, obviously with the dollar amount that uh, was awarded in the Samsung case, design patents have been something that uh, um, I've started to look at again and trying to figure out uh, how can I get uh, a couple of design patents in different areas. Because if this is upheld, design patents might be very valuable, uh, much more valuable than uh, uh, a traditional utility patent. So um, that's a real world impact. I think a lot of people are probably looking at design patents. I haven't seen statistics from the patent office if the number of filings have gone up yet or not. Um, but uh, it, it would be interesting to see if others uh, feel the same way as I do. Thanks, Matthew. Our next case we're going to discuss is SCA Hygiene Products, a word I will not attempt to pronounce, versus First Quality Baby Products, LLC. And the question presented here is a fairly clean and narrow uh, legal issue. You see it on your screen. What, to what extent does the defense of latches bar a claim for patent infringement brought within the Patent Act six-year statutory limitations period? You see the briefing is coming in almost as we speak. Petitioner's briefing due tomorrow. Respondent's briefing due in September. Oral argument probably October or November of this year. The key case around which SDA hygiene revolves is the Supreme Court's decision in Petrella versus Metro Goldwyn Mayer, also affectionately known as the Raging Bull case, had to do with the copyright on Raging Bull. You see uh, Robert De Niro, I guess that's Robert De Niro. He doesn't look like himself in that picture, if that's him. Um, and in that case, it's a very similar question under the Copyright Act. And the court held that latches could not be applied during the statute of limitations. If a plaintiff brings a claim or seeks damages that fall within the three-year Copyright Act statute of limitations, then latches cannot be applied as a defense to bar that recovery. The court held that you cannot apply an equitable doctrine like latches when the plain language of the copyright statute is clear on limitations. There you see a contrast between the Copyright Act on your right with its three-year statute of limitations and the fairly similar language providing for a six-year statute of limitations under the Patent Act. <clears throat> Well, nonetheless, the Federal Circuit uh, did not think that Petrella controlled the question of latches under the Patent Act. Instead, the court distinguished Petrella and held that latches, a latches defense could be applied even to damages that fall within the statute of limitations. And the court did that by looking at its precedent. Uh, it's precedent in the A.C. Ackerman Company case on Bonk uh, had interpreted the patent statute, Section 282, 
to uh, find that Congress intended to include latches expressly as a defense. You, you can see the statutory language there yourself from Section 282. You can decide whether you think that was correct, uh, whether that reference to unenforceability being a defense uh, is, is sufficient uh, to refer to latches. But that's how the Federal Circuit saw it. They held that uh, that codification meant that uh, even within the statute of limitations period, latches could be applied. The fact that the court granted this case probably means the writing's on the wall. It probably means that at least the court is uh, initially predisposed to say that uh, Petrella looks awfully relevant to this case. Uh, but then again, you never know. The court does sometimes the grant federal circuit cases in a firm, and sometimes things look a little bit differently after the court gets all the briefing. Uh, Matthew, would you uh, like to offer any thoughts on the impact of, uh, of CERC grant here and, and what the decision could mean? Well, you know, my first reaction is I think what you were alluding to, um, you know, the Supreme Court in Raging Bull, uh, um, you know, if, if they're going to apply the same view of latches there to the three-year statute of limitations in uh, copyrights to the six-year in patents, um, you know, uh, the writing might be on the wall that uh, um, latches as a defense might go away. I, I would say that, you know, when I look at um, the 507 in the Copyright Act versus the uh, 286 in the Patent Act, one is really dealing with standing and the other one is dealing with damages. And I wonder if the Supreme Court isn't going to look at those two statutes and say they're actually dealing with uh, different elements um, of a case, and therefore a different standard could apply, even though both times they're talking about applying latches. So, um, but in, in either case, if if the the I think this case is a good one. If you look at the facts of the the time frame, because there was a seven year delay in the suit, and patent acts allow you to reach back six years. I think this is a good one for the Supreme Court to reverse the federal circuit, just looking at the underlying facts, if, if that's what they're going for. So um, if I had to predict, I would say the Supreme Court's going to um, mirror what it did in Raging Bull into the patent world, but, uh, um, and, you know, that would have some uh, interesting consequences. It would make things a lot easier for the patent owners. Um, and I think HALO was the first time in a long time uh, that we had seen something that was pro-patent owner, or clearly pro-patent owner. Um, and I think the, the last one I can think of is the Misanto back in 2012, which was a very narrow uh, case, but that was pro-patent owner for people that grow um, patents on seeds. Um, really doesn't apply outside of that, I don't think. so. If the patent office, if the Supreme Court is looking to balance its rulings and give a couple uh, rulings to patent owners, this would be a good one. Um, and I think if they want to mirror what they did in the copyright side, which I, I think there's a probably a bias towards that in the Supreme Court, um, then the Federal Circuit will get reversed here and latches will disappear. Thank you, Matthew. So the last, and as Aaron had noted, I mean, th having three already accepted cert petitions in the patent area is, is a pretty good lineup for next year. The last one is the most recent, which is the Life Technologies case. Before we discuss that case, uh, we do need to give an affirmation number to all of our participants so that they can get their CL, very important CLE credit. The number for this webinar is five eight five, six, four. And just in case you didn't have your pen ready, it's five, eight, five, six, four. All right, let's move on and talk about life technologies. So life technologies concerns a section of the Patent Act, 271F1 is the particular language at issue. But the issue also kind of stretches to 271F2, because while it's not at issue, we'll see that those two sections work together. 
What it basically, and the, the question presented is whether the Federal Circuit erred in holding that supplying a single commodity component of a multi-component invention from the United States, where it's going to be put together outside the United States, you know, does that create liability here? And it's important to note that 271F really came along as a, as a congressional pushback against a Supreme Court case where it had been fairly blatant that the infringer had just put every, had manufactured all of the parts and put them all together and sent them overseas and had them assembled overseas. And the Supreme Court had said, well, you know, that's extraterritorial, no patent infringement. And, you know, sometimes bad facts result in a new law, and that's what happened in that case, and we got 271F. Now, what's interesting is 271F has two pieces, F1 and F2. F2 is the piece that's really directed to a, a single component being provided because it talks about any component that is especially made or adapted for the invention. The problem for the plaintiff in this case was that a particular component at issue was a commodity component. It, was, it could be used in other ways. And as a result, they had to try instead 271F1. So 271F2 is out of the picture. So instead, they tried 271F1, which has the language substantial portion of the components. So they had to meet that requirement. Here's that language of 271F1, and you can see all or a substantial portion of the components. Now, that substantial portion then is read where such components are uncombined in whole or in part. And it's really important to know whether such components is referring to the substantial portion or is it referring to all of the components when they arrive outside the United States. And here's the 271F2, and you'll see there the not staple article of commerce, or not a staple article or commodity of commerce. And again, that's why the pulling of here had to use 271F1. Well, the real issue is going to be a statutory construction issue, but for those in the real world, the question is how do you distinguish one component from multiple components? The patent that's at issue in this case is a reissue patent. And the claim term that is the quote unquote one component is a poly polymerizing enzyme suitable for performing a primer directed polymerase chain reaction. Well, so that was considered to be one component, and all of the parties seem to say that's one component. But one question the Supreme Court will need to address is what if it was claimed differently but with no real change in scope and instead just had? a first molecule and a second molecule. I mean, there's no question that the reality of this vessel and the enzyme is that there are a lot of molecules involved. And the Supreme Court's going to have to decide whether just drafting the claim in a different manner is going to result in a different result. And they've actually commented on that issue in some of the 101 claim cases, that they don't want the result to hinge upon mere claim draftsmanship when the substance of the patent or the claim is the same. But they'll have to address that issue here. Uh, the one note I would make is this was a situation where the Supreme Court did ask for the Department of Justice to weigh in. There were originally two questions in this cert petition, and the Solicitor General was asked CVSG to comment and told them that they should do one but not the other. And the Supreme Court followed right along. They did choose to grant cert on just the one question the Solicitor General had pointed out. And so it's important to note that the Solicitor General has pushed hard saying the Federal Circuit should be reversed on this point and that one component cannot be a substantial portion. Now, given that the Supreme Court followed the Solicitor General with respect to whether to grant cert, you've got to think that the Solicitor General's opinion on whether it should be reversed or affirmed may have some substantial weight at the court, which means there's an uphill battle for those who want a single component to, to meet the 271F1 test. So that's what we see going forward, and uh, we really appreciate everyone who uh, tuned in for us to uh, discuss not only what has happened, but what we see on the horizon. Uh, hope this was worthwhile for everyone who participated, 
and uh, hope you'll tune in for our next webinar when we address more upcoming issues. Thank you, everyone.